And this conclusion is supported by several pieces of reliable historical evidence. There is uh, Ibn Rashud, for example, uh, he's known in the West as Abu Rose. Uh, he, he mentions that there is a consensus of the companions on this issue, that is, on the prohibition of prison execution. In fact, early and renowned figures in Islamic legal history, such as Sa'ad bin Jubayr, from the generation after the Prophet's companions, all reported a consensus among the companions that the historical practice of the Prophet clearly stipulated that prisoners of war could be dealt with in only two ways. Either you free them or you ransom them. Again, corroborated by many other sources, Ibn Ishaq in his biography, he reports that the Prophet divided the prisoners amongst his companions and said, treat them well. One of the prisoners, the Prophet, one of the prisoners is, all, he is, is, is quoted as recounting that when they ate their morning and evening meals, they gave me the bread and ate the dates themselves in accordance with the orders that the Apostle had given about us. If anyone had a morsel of bread, he gave it to me. In a separate case, there's another hadith which reports that the Prophet was unable to sleep because one of the prisoners captured in the Battle of Badr was bound too tightly, so the Prophet only relaxed once the prisoner's bindings were loosened. And there are many, many other anecdotes like this which we can go through, and I don't want to label the point again. Finally, the issue of suicide bombing. Again, there's a lot of debate about this, but I mean, for me, it's pretty clear. I mean, there's a, from a textual perspective, there is nothing within the text in the Quran or the prophetic traditions anywhere to suggest that committing suicide of any form is ever allowed. Um, destroy not yourselves, surely Allah is ever merciful to you, it's very, very clear. There is another hadith, I don't think I've got it up there. From Bukhari, the Prophet said, Amongst the nations before you, there was a man who received a wound. And growing impatient with his pain, he took a knife and cut his hand with it. And the blood didn't stop till he died. God said, My slave hurried to bring death upon himself, so I have forbidden him to enter paradise. So it's pretty clear, again, that there's, there's, just, there's no exceptions to this issue within the text. And even amongst the classical scholars, no one ever, amongst the classical scholars, ever said that you could carry out some kind of a suicide attack. This is something which is peculiarly modern to, to, to modern times. Finally, rounding up, conclusion and summary, number of main points that I've made there. The, the authentic Islamic paradigm, which I'm deriving from the Quran and the prophetic traditions, I'm arguing it's, it's essentially pacifist, it's pluralist in its recognition and acknowledgement of difference, and it's populist in the sense of being community-centered. War is only limited to defensive purposes throughout, or absolutely clear. War in terms of the conduct of war is regulated very strictly to protect civilians and non-combatants. Important point to emphasize there, by implication, modern modes of warfare, industrial, technological, and irregular or unconventional terrorism, are actually just illegitimate. I mean, there is actually, in my view, a very serious question mark over any use of weapons of mass destruction of any kind, not just nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, not even that. Even an indiscriminate firing of a missile that is going to destroy civilian infrastructure from an axiomatic Islamic perspective, it's illegitimate. We do not agree with it. We condemn it completely. Most classical legal opinions about jihad, I believe, deviated from this paradigm. I mean, there were classical scholars who, who disagreed with that, with, what a lot of the of their counterparts were saying. But there was a majority classical legal opinion. And unfortunately, it was the kind of stuff that I'd already discussed. And in my view, this opinion deviated from this paradigm due to the social, historical, and political context of the formulation. So at worst, you could say, well, there was a deviation. But you, at best, you would say that those rulings were correct within that context for their time but they do, do not have any validity now. In my, my view is actually that they were incorrect even at that time, but that doesn't disagree with me. But I think that they were, but, but that's the position you could take. Finally, this idea of the Makassid al-Sharia, the objective, the, the higher principle, the philosophy of the Sharia that we discussed, also formulated by the classical scholars themselves, actually elucidates this broader Islamic ethical framework of universal human rights, which we elaborated, which emphasizes the necessity for us to return to this original paradigm and to look at these things in this wider context. So that is basically the summation of our presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.